Part 1. Part 1. You'll hear someone booking transport for a trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 and 2. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 and 2. Good morning, Burnham Coaches. Sarah speaking. How can I help you? Ah, yes. Good morning. I'm a teacher at the Down Language School. We have a bit of a problem and I was wondering if you could help us out. What is the problem exactly? Well, we normally take our students on an excursion at the end of their course. But unfortunately, the coach firm we normally use has let us down. It seems they've gone out of business. I'm sorry to hear that. I suppose you are looking for a replacement. Well, yes. We won't need a very large coach, actually. There will be 30 students and four teachers. So that's 34 in all. And what dates did you have in mind? The last Saturday and Sunday of this month. That's the 28th and 29th. The 28th and 29th. Does that mean you are planning to stay somewhere overnight? That's right. Actually, we want to do the same excursion that we do every year. We usually visit Stonehenge, Salisbury and stay overnight in Bath. It's a historical tour, really. It sounds interesting. Let me just see what we have available. Oh dear, I'm afraid all our coaches are booked out for the 28th. It's the busiest time of the year for us, actually. I was afraid that would be a problem. But you have a coach available for the 29th? Yes, we do. And it's available for the 30th as well, if that's any help to you. I'm afraid not. Sunday is the last day. The students go home on Monday. I think we'll just have to change our plans a bit and leave out Salisbury. It's a shame, but I don't think we can fit in all three places in one day. So, you would like to book the coach for the 29th, visiting Stonehenge and Bath, is that right? Yes, I think so. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 3 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. Right, I just need a few details, sir. OK. My name is Paul Scott. S-C-O-T? It's double T, actually. I'm sorry. And it's the Down Language School. Could you give me the address for that, Mr Scott? Yes, it's Down House... Hill Street, Brighton. Do you need the postcode? No, that's not necessary, but I do need a contact number. Of course. The number for the school secretary is 01273 512 634. You can contact her if you need to speak to anyone. Right, and what time would you like the coach to pick you up? Well... I think we'll have to make an early start. Would 7.30 be all right? Yes, no problem at all. What time do you want to be back? Oh, any time between 10 and 11 will be all right. Not later than 11, though. Right, I'll make a note of that. 11pm latest. There's just one more thing I need to know. Presumably, you'll be visiting Stonehenge first. How long do you want to stay there? Well... We normally stay about an hour. The main objective of the excursion is for the students to see the Georgian architecture in Bath, really. Yes, Bath is lovely, isn't it? I was there myself a couple of years ago. I thought the Royal Crescent was absolutely stunning. 
I hadn't realised how large it is. Well, I think that's all I need to know, Mr Scott. Thank you for booking with us. Just a minute. There's one thing you seem to have forgotten. How much will this cost? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I was thinking about Bath. Just bear with me a moment. Yes, it's a round trip of 300 miles and a total time of 16 hours for the driver. For a 45-seater coach, that will be a total of £500, including tax and insurance. Do we have to have such a large coach? There are only 34 of us. We don't have any smaller coaches, I'm afraid. Oh, well. At least we won't be cramped for space. When do we have to pay? We require a 20% deposit to confirm the booking. I suggest that you do that as soon as possible, today if you can. The balance you can give to the driver if you're paying by cheque. Have the cheque made out to Burnham Coaches. I think that'll be all right. I will have to check this with the school accountant, but if all is well, I'll arrange for someone to bring you the deposit within the next two hours. That'll be fine, Mr Scott. Well, thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a lecture on art and culture in the Indonesian island of Bali. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Last week, we looked at the traditional art of Japan. In this week's lecture, we're going to move south and look at the very special way in which art has developed in the beautiful island of Bali, which is now part of Indonesia. I'll begin by giving you a brief historical overview. It's thought that the first inhabitants of Bali were farmers who arrived around 3000 BC, at the beginning of the Iron Age. They probably originally came from China, and in Bali they cultivated rice and built temples ornamented with wood and stone carvings and statues. The Hindu religion was introduced in the 14th century AD, and this has remained the main religion on the island. This was an important period in the artistic development of the island, when sculptors, poets, priests and painters worked together in the service of the ruling families. Rather than painting everyday scenes, artists concentrated on narrative paintings illustrating the epic stories of Hinduism. Bali's rich natural resources have always made it an alluring goal for merchants, and from the 17th century onwards, Dutch ships visited the island to trade in spices and luxury goods. Gradually, the old royal families lost their power, and eventually, in 1906, the Dutch East Indies Company was founded, and the island became a colony. In the 20th century, art then took on a very different role, as a tool accessible to everyone in the fight of the Balinese people against colonisation, rather than as the property of a minority. Shortly after this, in the 1920s, stories of the beauty of the island of Bali began to spread around the world, and Balinese art underwent another vast transformation with the advent of tourism to the island. At first, this was only on a small scale, but it had important effects. 
expatriate artists from Holland and Germany settled on the island, bringing paper, Chinese ink, and other new materials with them. They worked with local artists, encouraging them to experiment with concepts like naturalism, expressionism, light, and perspective, as well as to move away from the traditional focus on narrative painting towards something closer to their own experience. When independence came in 1945, this desire for an art to match a new national identity became stronger, and the traditional narrative paintings started to give way to scenes showing the everyday life of the Balinese people, harvests, market scenes, and daily tasks, as well as the myths and legends of their history. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Many of the features that give this art its special place in the world today can be traced back to these historical roots. One feature that is rooted in the events of the last century is that today in Bali the production and the appreciation of art is not restricted to a minority. In fact, there is a famous saying that in Bali. Everyone is an artist, and it's not considered that to make art or talk about art any formal training is needed. Art is just produced as part of Balinese life. Even fruit salad is served with flowers strewn on top. One factor which has contributed to this productivity is Bali's fertility. Over the centuries, the rich soil and the fact that food and shelter are readily available has given the islanders the leisure to develop their arts. While painting, sculpture, carving, and music have traditionally been the province of men, women have channeled their creative energy into making lavish offerings to the gods with spectacular pyramids of flowers, fruit, and cakes offered at the temples on festival days and celebrations. All these kinds of art still have close links with the religion of the people, and are something that people do on a daily basis. Another special characteristic of art in Bali is that it is not generally seen as an individual pursuit. In the West, art is often carried out by the artist on his own, reflecting his own individual world view in the hope of achieving personal wealth and fame. For Balinese artists, art is something that's done as a group, and many artists may participate in one piece of work. And Balinese art is not restricted to temples and offerings; it decorates objects such as jackets, motorcycles, hotel menus, and so on. But perhaps the most significant characteristic of Balinese art, and one that distinguishes it most from the art of the West, is to do with its expected lifespan. Carvings are made in soft stone, which is gradually destroyed over the years. The humid climate rots paper and cloth paintings. The magnificent offerings of fruit and sweets are eaten. Wooden statues are destroyed by insects. But Balinese artists accept that their work is ephemeral, not permanent, and instead of slavishly preserving the originals, they produce new art. And all this rebuilding, renovating, and replacing means that the island's art continually evolves and perpetuates itself. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. 
you will hear somebody talking to a group of students about a university language centre. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, I'm Katie Shaw and I work at the University Language Centre. Your tutor tells me you might be interested in using the centre, so I'm here at the college to explain a bit about it and, of course, to answer your questions. Where exactly is the centre? Is it near the college? It's actually on King's Road, just round the corner from here, in fact. Oh, I know it, yes. I wondered what that building was. Yes. What's there? Well, the library has about 4,000 books, pamphlets and transcripts to go with some of the 12,500 items on audio or video cassettes. These are at a wide range of levels of difficulty, covering language learning material in over 100 languages. There are also reference books without tapes, including dictionaries, grammars, grammar workbooks, vocabulary workbooks and model letters, as well as texts on academic writing and effective study habits, etc. Audio cassette workrooms are on the first floor, by the way. Do they get any foreign language press there too? Yes. The library subscribes to a number of European daily and weekly newspapers, including Le Monde from France, L'Espresso from Italy, and the weekly international edition of the Spanish paper El País. What about learning with computers? Can you do that there? Call, or computer-aided language learning, is available on the first floor. Um, how many PCs are there? Counting both Macintosh and PC platforms, there are nine at present. There are materials in over 15 different languages and new material and language categories are being added as library funds permit. The programmes cover verb drills, uh, grammar exercises, activities to accompany multimedia textbooks, pronunciation, translation and some multimedia applications. The same hardware permits access to the internet with its many language learning and discussion sites. What about TV? That's a good way of learning a language too. Yes, definitely. We agree. So on the second floor of the centre, there are televisions to view live satellite television broadcasts in seven languages. Oh, which ones are they? Currently, we've got Arabic, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish and Russian. Turkish broadcasting can be viewed live on request. The centre records the news in French, German... Arabic, Italian, Japanese, Spanish and Russian. And English too. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Sounds great. How do we sign up? To avoid paying a fee, you need to go to the centre with a valid university ID card or a letter from your college or departmental administrator on headed paper indicating your status, length of stay and language requirements. Are there any forms to fill in? I'm afraid so. Mm. You do that at the ground floor reception desk. Your registration is for one academic year only and needs to be renewed annually. You should tell the librarian who you are on your first visit and you will need to take part in an induction to the library service, including the proper operation of the centre's computers, televisions, videos and so on. Can she help us choose the right materials too? Yes. The librarian can give advice and assistance in locating material, making best use of the texts and tapes and so on. 
Let her know which language you want to study and what, if any, knowledge of it you already have. Also, say what reasons you have for learning the language. Your answers will help the librarian help you make the best choice of books and tapes for your needs. She can also offer you advice on how much time is needed to make progress in the language and can offer suggestions on how to improve your language learning techniques. Can she copy tapes for us to take home or can we borrow them? The library is a resource centre and reference library only. You can do as much self-study listening and reading work there as you want. But it's not possible to take home materials, that's to say, books or cassettes. And copyright law doesn't permit the library or its staff to make copies of cassettes for use by students outside the centre. All material must be used on the premises, I'm afraid. This ensures the materials are always available for students working on their own and not out on loan for long periods, which could harm users' progress. So, if we can't take books home, is it OK to photocopy them? The library staff will handle any photocopying, though international copyright law prohibits users from copying more than 5% of any one title in the academic year. You place a photocopy order with the librarian or an assistant and orders will be processed between 1 and 2 o'clock or after 5.30. How much does it cost? 10 pence per page. Payment is by photocopy card, which you can buy from the information desk on the ground floor. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on cities of the future. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 37. OK, we've been looking at how societies will develop in the future and at the increase in the size of cities. So I want to talk to you today about the key considerations in these cities of the future. There are three key elements I want to look at, and these are the new features they will have, issues of size, and the main problems to be considered. First of all, individual transportation will be a big factor in these new megacities as public transport becomes unmanageable. There'll be a huge rise in the use of segways, which are personal transporters, like motorised scooters. As a result, and partly also to reduce pollution, roads will be altered so that they are narrower and will take up less of a city's space than they do currently. Naturally, this is a major change to the infrastructure and something that may hinder it is the huge amount of investment it will require. The next thing is, what is going to happen to the commercial areas? We do not want these to become even larger concrete jungles than they are at present, so we have to look at design. And current designs for city development include building gardens on the roofs of these buildings to make a more pleasant environment for workers. And you may think that these areas will expand to cope with increased commercial activity. In fact, the prediction is that they will cover one-fifth of the area that they do at present as we build upwards. 
The exception to this is shopping centres, which we predict will expand with more and more temperature-controlled malls. What may cause difficulties is that the superstores will be confined to the outer edges of the city, as they will be too big to fit into the new malls. Then, of course, there are the residential areas, and these will undergo their own changes. One particular development will be houses which are built from glass, as innovations in this material allow it to provide light without causing problems with temperature inside a building. The residential areas will not be allowed to expand without limit, as happens in some areas at present, and their size will be restricted to a population of 15,000. One issue, which has yet to be resolved, and I'm not sure it ever will be, is how we manage to house older residents. They will be increasing in numbers as time goes on. Finally, how will these cities live? We know we have limited energy sources, so what will we do? Well, something currently in development, which will be a feature, is that waste is going to become an energy source. For example, to provide gas in homes. Also, as new technology and systems are developed, we will find that energy plants will become smaller. Another energy source we could use, but one which raises issues of having enough space and too much noise, is wind farms. Because of the problems, I'm not convinced these will be the grand solution to our energy problems that we thought they were going to be. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 38 to 40. Now, moving on to looking at the social aspect of cities, we need to look at housing and how people will live. Cities currently have flats in the centre, populated by single people and wealthier residents, and families tend to move to the outskirts. In the future, the centre of cities will see a dramatic change. We will see many more examples of cooperative buildings. This is where people join together to form a company that owns the building they live in. And despite continuing shortages, there will also be a rise in the provision of retirement homes in city centres so that the elderly can have easy access to hospitals and shops. Recently, we have seen a levelling off in the growth of private housing, and I think that will not change. But we are likely to see more social housing, as far fewer people will be able to afford to own their own homes. OK, now, if anybody has... Any That is the end of part four. Check your answers.